love the chase and the hunt and I set the pace when I'm running I always take what I want and I always give it 100 Don't need a bank, no I'm funded Play the game like it's nothing I'm always thankful for something Don't take for granted Say Hello, hello Hello, hello Marta How are you doing? I'm doing fine as usual <laughs> I know that you don't like that sentence but <laughs> usually I'm fine What about you? I'm good. Well, if it's genuine, then I, I believe you. You can say you're fine. I'm fine too. Very excited today. We have a really, really cool guest with us. And I think I'm going to do a very short introduction of our guest and then uh, you can get to know her better. Uh, so with us today is Elizabeth Weiss, and she's a professor of anthropology of, at San Jose University in California. Her research expertise is in skeletal analysis of, and that's going to be a hard word that I'm not sure if I'm going to pronounce correctly, but it's called osteoarthritis or something like that. Elizabeth, please tell me later how to pronounce this. <laughs> uh, muscle, <laughs> muscle markers and bone cross sections to reconstruct lifestyle and better understand bone biology. But besides that, she she also published several books. One of her more, re more recent ones is rep uh, Repatriation or Anti-Raising the Past. Uh, she also wrote a book called Reading the Bones, uh, Activity, Biology and Culture, and also Pale uh, Paleopathology in Perspective, Bone Health and Disease Through Time. And as you guys can tell, uh, I don't use this word very much, <laughs> so I'm sorry for mispronouncing everything, but uh, please welcome Elizabeth. Hello. Thank you. Hello, uh, and no worries about any mispronunciations. You did a very good job. A lot of my students um, don't do it that well, and they're English speakers. So. Okay, she speaks very good English, Marta. So I will say. These Next are very difficult words. Yep, yeah, very difficult. <laughs> okay. Well, let's first focus on your profession itself first, because um, as many people, including myself. Uh, we are. We don't really know what uh, anthropology or archaeology really entails. Um, this program is well. We were interested in in interviewing you because uh, from the point of view of getting to know what archaeology or anthropology is from an expert's point of view, and also because uh, we found interesting um, kind of the retaliation that you have suffered uh, regarding uh, uh, your view on. And what to do with uh, human remains uh, uh, according to the repatriation law and um, well I, I hope you want to talk about that if not that's okay because <laughs> we are happy with uh, just getting to know a little bit more about this field because in this program we are interested about anything so let's for first start with that so what, what, what is anthropology and um, how does it differ from archaeology or you know it's it's actually there's a lot of overlap um, and in the in Europe Usually uh, what I do is considered archaeology, um, but here it would be called physical anthropology or biological anthropology. And then there's some um, who call it bioarchaeology. So basically, if you think of anthropology as the larger umbrella term, that means a study of um, people. Um, mm. And that incorporates both living people like different cultures um, that would be cultural anthropology or social anthropology. And then there's uh, physical anthropology that studies um, human evolution and people of the past and um, some components of biology. Um, this would be like, um, you know, the Neanderthal studies, for example, are physical anthropology. Um, and then there's archaeology, which includes a study of artifacts. Mm -hmm. um, so if you think about um, the study of Egypt, ancient Egypt, that would be um, archaeology. Um, when you're looking at the pyramids and the um, burial goods, that would be a good example of archaeology. But what I do mainly, um, not, not exclusively, but mainly is I study the skeletal remains that are found in archaeological sites. So mm -hmm. for example, if you have a site, an ancient site of, um, let's say, a 3,000-year-old site here in California, there might be an archaeologist that would look at the um, arrowheads and the pot shards, you know, the rem um, remnants of the artifacts, and I would look at the bones from that site. And therefore, I would be considered the bioarchaeologist, looking at the biological component of the archaeological site. Yeah. And so and what I do when I look at skeletal remains is I try to, there's 
really um, three main focuses. One is I try to reconstruct what past people's lives were like. So what did they die of? How were they, um, were they doing certain types of activities? Did the males and females have different activities? What were they eating? Things like that. So I'm, I'm trying to, so, so to speak, put flesh back on the bones, trying to bring that story back to life. Mm-hmm. And so that's a big component of my work to reconstruct past people's lives. Mm-hmm. And I take that very seriously because I think that they don't have any other voice except for it's, our voice uh, yeah. to help tell their story. These are a prehistoric peoples and they do not leave a written le- record. Yeah, this is. The, yeah, I was, was going to say that this is uh, this uh, profession fascinates me because I can't even remember what I did last Friday, and then you guys uh, come up with uh, a version of what uh, people in the ancient times uh, yeah, used to do, and that's fascinating. I mean, and I'm interested in how you really <laughs> get to that information. But yeah, that's sorry to interrupt. And so the, another component that I do is I use the skeletal remains to understand bone biology Mm. Um, so more as a basic trying to understand the causes of certain diseases the patterns of disease so one of the the difficult words was osteoarthritis (laughs) and um, it's basically a joint disease degenerative joint disease we would can we would sometimes call this um, arthritis like what older people get but in past populations Um, young people got this too. Um, And so why the difference in patterns is one of the things that helps us understand not only the past people's lives and health status and levels of pain they may or may not have had, but also what has changed now and therefore can help us understand today's disease patterns. So that's another component of it. And then I think The third component is just as a more general comparison. So for example, um, a few years back, I was looking at at foot bones to compare with early human foot bones to see what kind of growth patterns um, and fusion patterns of the foot occurred in past people um, and in early humans and how that can help inform us about growth. This is also useful for forensic anthropology. So when you're looking at skeletal remains to to, um, solve crimes. So one of the things we look at in forensic anthropology is we wanna determine how old the individual was when they died. Like, was it a teenager? Was it an adult? And one way we look at that is on bones, there are lines that we call fusion lines, like, where the growth plate um, separates the end of the bone and the shaft, and then eventually they fuse and you stop growing. And so these lines, sometimes um, even after fusion, they still exist. And we find that they, in some areas of the body, decades, literally decades after the bone has stopped growing, you can still see the fusion line. And therefore, you wouldn't want to mistake that as a person who had just stopped growing, if it's an 80-year-old, just because you saw the fusion line. So it can help forensics. So those are the things that I do with, um, that I look at with skeletal remains. And I look, um, I look at the whole, um, the whole body, right? The whole skeleton. I don't only look at skulls, but skulls are fascinating to most people. And therefore, mm. um, we do focus. Especially now in Halloween, right? <laughs> right. Especially now. But um, but I look at everything from the foot bones to the head, right? Because they all have information that can be used to answer these types of questions. Yeah, great. That sounds super interesting. Can you also tell us, um, have you always dreamed about this being your job or did you have some other plan in the past and this just came to be your career somehow? So when I was a child, like, you know, like a, a eight year olds for say, um, I always loved anatomy. Like 
the toys that I would get often were like, um, you know, building a skeleton together or building a model eye, you know, so I always had this love of anatomy. Um, and this, I didn't think of it as an anthropology even in high school because I, I basically wasn't really familiar with the, the field of anthropology. Mm. Um, I don't think I, if you had said, oh, do you want to be an anthropologist or an archaeologist? I would have been like, well, what, you know, what would that entail? Uh, what would that contain? Um, but so prior to beginning college and in my er first year at university, I wanted, I thought I would do um, pre-med. So I thought I'd become a medical doctor. And, um, but what I found that was that anthropology really aligned with all of my most um, prominent interests. So anatomy, the study of um, evolution, and of course the medical aspect of diseases. And so I really fell in love with it from that perspective. But the first part of that puzzle is the anatomy part. Mm -hmm. And what kind of person should not be an archaeologist or an anthropologist, never according to you? I mean, imagine if you're a type A person that needs everything in its place and everything and every place in its time, and to really know with exactitude what happened in the past, uh, is that the kind of person that shouldn't be an anthropologist or? I kind of think, it, I kind of think of myself as that way. I'm very neat and and I think that's, that's actually a very good trait to have as an anthropologist or archaeologist because there's a lot of different moving pieces around or a lot of yeah. different aspects that you want to keep very organized. Mm. Um, but I think people um, who might not be uh, comfortable with uh, the, the fact that you might figure something out and, you know, five years later, it becomes, un, you know, you were wrong. You know, so if you're not comfortable with perhaps um, the, you know, new information proving you wrong, um, that's that's one thing. But the other thing is, I think um, you have to love to read and write. Okay. Um, so <laughs> if you don't like to read or write, it's probably not the field for you. <laughs> okay. and, and I think that you, you need to have the ability to, of course, work with others, but also to spend much time um, and patience um, alone figuring out certain things, even if it is just, um, you know, putting together the skeletal remains um, or cleaning the skeletal remains and, and curating them. One of the things I, I find um, that I still love even now is um, when I first open a box of bones mm -hmm. that there still may be something surprising in there. And oftentimes, even if it's a skeleton that you've seen many times, because the body is so nuanced that you might have missed something. Mm. And I love that aspect of it. But um, not, not everybody has the patience for that. Or, mm. And not everybody um, ha is very visual. I think it's also a very visual field. So, you know, looking, literally looking at the remains um, is... Um, is something that I enjoy, but if you're not if you're not a very visual person, I think that that might be problematic. It's probably an art, right? I mean, because yeah. we have this uh, utopic uh, vision of Indiana Jones as an archaeologist from the movies, and I and maybe yeah. like the real life is kind of different. But yeah, that's interesting. Hmm. Yeah, I think as Pedro said, uh, when I was thinking about archaeology, the Indiana Jones picture kind of came into into my head very like uh, very very quickly. Um, I want I'm wondering what is the thing that you find like the hardest and the thing that you find the most fascinating about the job. Um, I think what I find most difficult is is the politics of it. I would say. Um, this, and we'll probably get to this um, later on again, yeah. of course, but the laws that um, require repatriation of reburial of remains, because I see this as, um, as losing data. And I also see it as we don't know whether these people would have wanted to be reburied. We're just making an assumption based on modern peoples that this is what they would want but it is truly an assumption. And I also think that it is a hindrance to the progress of science. 
So I do find that part very difficult. Um, now I always I always comply with the law, but um, because I've been outspoken about my um, dislike uh, for repatriation, um, I've been um, I've faced a lot of retaliation. Yeah. I think that that's one aspect. Um, so I think that that is the most difficult part. Um, I still all you know as a professor, I still enjoy um, teaching about the topic. Of course, I I've, I've always loved you know literally having uh, um, going through the skeletal remains, having a collection to look at, and I enjoy writing. So all those three things are still very enjoyable. Okay, um, tell me, like, have you ever discovered a new site uh, yourself? Have you been involved in discovering something new from scratch, or it's always been like a pre-existing discovered sites, and you've worked on the on those? Um, well, I have been in the field several times, um, but most of the, my career has been spent uh, curating mm. collections that have already been co have already been excavated. Okay. And one of the things is one. One of the big differences between um, places like the U.S. and Canada and places like um, Africa, and mm. I did, I was in field school in Africa, is that most of the sites that we have in the U.S. are actually sites that were not intentionally excavated. They're they're what we call salvage archaeology. So. Mm they are remains recovered from um, construction sites from when the roads were built, when certain, um, certain things were uh, modernized. And I think this is a, a misconception that a lot of people have about archeologists in the US that we go looking for graves. Mm. Um, we don't, <laughs> mm. um, for the most part, they are skeletal remains that have been uncovered um, as a result of, of basically modern, the modern world, right? Yeah. Buildings and roads and so forth. And then we, as archeologists, as biological anthropologists have basically preserved them from being bulldozed mm -hmm. um, and curated them to try to help tell the story of the past. Okay. Uh, you actually mentioned something funny. I live in a building where uh, there are some ancient remains uh, from Rome. And yeah, that is still to my, the construction of my building for four years. Um, right. And I think they they left the remainings uh, there just for the future. And um, it's very interesting. But uh, the I mean, I, I'm, I'm very focused on archaeology. We will move to uh, other things. I know you've been mainly curating, but you know you know a lot about this stuff. But I just want to ask, I'm like, uh, how do archaeologists, uh, when they find a site or when they go to a site, how, what are the main steps that they need to do? I mean, is it like you have to document everything quickly there and then like you have to in interpret and then protect the remainings? Or how does that work? So usually... Um, there usually there is a, a team, right, um, that will do the excavation, and they will basically um, take various steps to preserve at least part of the site for future generations. So one of the concepts in archaeology is that you shouldn't excavate the entire site because the next generation of archaeologists and by bioarchaeologists should have better techniques than you did right <laughs> okay. so um so they decide what to excavate especially if it's not a site that is in danger of being destroyed um depending on the um depending on the remains um the condition of the remains they may be removed and curate boxed and so forth at the field mm -hmm. um hopefully well documented. Right mm. now I'm working on a collection from Carthage and mm. um, which was excavated in the early 80s and not by me, but by others. And I noticed that um, there were some seasons, there were some summers where they did excavation that they were better at documenting things than other set summers. <laughs> um, so certain notes are less clear than other notes. But so one of the things is to try to document as much as possible. But 
But the other thing is that they, if it's very fragile, they may remove it in block, like try to um, firm up whatever is surrounding it and then remove the skeleton or artifacts from mm -hmm. the soils in the lab. Um, and the other thing is that um, oftentimes what we have in archaeology is that these uh, excavations are, as I said, are done by a team of people. And most often a team of faculty professors with students. So um, I don't know a single archaeologist or physical anthropologist who hasn't been in at least one field school, for example. Mm -hmm. And if I went to um, field school in, um, in Kenya, the Kubifora field school, and um, so we did excavations of both. Uh, we did an excavation of a 5,000 year old um, burial site there. Um, and we also looked for early human remains. Um, and then the other thing is, um, I did early on in, uh, as a student, right between my, between my undergraduate and my PhD, so doing my master's, hmm. I did field school in um, Big Sur, California, which is right on the coast. And um, it was for a um, national park that was improving their rest room and rest stop facilities. Mm -hmm. And so we did excavation there. So usually you have like certain tests, pits, and you excavate them by layers. And once you find something, then you are more detail oriented and taking small layers at a time to make sure that you don't. Um, miss anything, but that you also don't destroy anything. Okay. Um, the other thing is then once it, the remains are in a lab or curation facility, mm -hmm. that's when the cleaning and the boxing and the labeling comes. And hopefully you can determine how many individuals you have. And um, hopefully you didn't miss too much either. Um, it's one of the things I find amazing is um, in my in the last in the collection that I'm looking at right now, which is a seventh century um, AD Carthage collection, um, they managed to even though the remains are not very well preserved at all, they managed to even get even sieve out and re and rescue the little tiny foot bones. So these bones are like maybe the quarter a quarter size of a cent oh, so, you know <laughs> they're really little that's precision <laughs> yes yeah. yes so um it's it's a, a it's very interesting to see what's preserved and what's not but it's also you know these things they're not necessarily the big glamorous things always but it just brings joy to my face to think about the fact that somebody went through this and was able to preserve, uh, to find these tiny bones and they too tell us a story. Yeah, indeed. Mm -hmm. I mean, and just the thought also of being found in the future. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's kind of uh, a new, uh, very beautiful idea. Anyway, sorry, Marta. Yeah, uh, no, I was wondering, because um, you mentioned, it sounds like a quite long process, right? Since there is uh, something found on the site. So I guess one question would be how long the process usually takes from finding something until it's all like labeled in the boxes. Another question is, how do you find out how old those things are? And we heard about something called like carbon-14 dating, but we don't know much about it. But if you could tell us a little bit more about the, uh, yeah. So, um one of the things is it really depends the, the time uh, of discovery to the time of curation and the first, let's say the first publication really depends on the site. It can be mm. as little as one year. It could be, you know, several years. It can be decades. It just really depends. There's a, quite a lot of variation. Um, one of the um, interesting things is that once a skeletal collection is curated, um, most people think, okay, you have the skeletal collection, you curate it, you study it, and then they're done, but you're never done. Mm -hmm. um, they're really databases or data sets, you can think of them, that can be re-examined multiple times from different angles, from different, looking for different aspects, um, you know, for everything from looking at literally the macroscopic, what you can see with your eyes, 
to x-raying to DNA, right? So it, the whole slew. Um, and therefore, once you have a skeletal collection, um, it really is a collection that can be used multiple times over. The collection that I curated prior to um, my uh, prior to my book coming out and, and a lot of the actions happening um, in the last few years was called the Ryan Mound. And it's a large collection of over 300 individuals. And this collection, although it was excavated, um, the last excavation occurred in the late 60s, um, it was used for studies right up to the time that 2020, pretty much right up to COVID time, I would say. And there's maybe about 200 studies that have been done on, on this one collection, maybe even more, but definitely around 200. Um, so that's one aspect. The other thing is the antiquity, determining how old the site is, as the remains are. This can be done with great, uh, radiocarbon dating for almost all archeological sites. Um, basically with radiocarbon dating, you're looking at the isotope of the different isotopes. So different types of carbon change over time. So you're looking at a proportion of carbons um, to see how old the remains are. Um, this is done literally on the bones or the teeth because of um, the carbon in the human body. It cannot that be done with fossils because mm -hmm. fossils are not bone anymore. They're stone. Oh, I didn't know so that. That's interesting. There's, um, and of course, there's some fossils who are more stone and some bone, you know, and there's variation. But if it's something's completely fossilized, carbon oh. dating cannot be used. Do you have but any other are, dating method apart from carbon? And uh, uh, Yes. So there's lots of other dating methods there, but all the other radioactive, the isotope mm. ones, like um, there's potassium argon, for example, do not date the actual remains, but date the soil around the remains, right? So it's, it's basically in the context. We also have obsidian hydration. So obsidian is a kind of a, a, um, a kind of glass, like a silica that it can be dated use it um, can be also date used for dating, excuse me. Um, but again, it's not dating the bones except it's dating the, the context in this, um, that the bones are in. And obsidian hydration is interesting because obsidian is used to make a lot of artifacts. It was used to make a lot of artifacts like our arrowheads. And so sometimes like in the, in the Ryan Mount collection that I talk, talked about, it's a um, California prehistoric collection of hunters and gatherers. And basically um, some of these individuals literally have obsidian arrow points stuck in their bones. So we can date the arrowhead that's stuck in the bone, but not the bone itself. Now the likelihood is that that's a very close date, of course. So we get the date that way. But then there are other things like um, the Carthage collection that I was talking about um, is dated mainly using coins. So this is seventh century AD and the skeletal collection um, ha in the cemetery, there were coins around. Um, and so they, if you know the age of the coin, then you know the age of about of the remains. So artifacts couldn't help. So those are some of the many ways of, of dating um, the mm -hmm. skeletal collection. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. I mean, um, there is a, I think it's time to move. I mean, if, if you agree to okay. talk about the controversy thing, that's... Absolutely. Uh, yeah, because uh, you filed a lawsuit against uh, your university because you felt regulated. Uh, can, you, can you explain a little bit uh, the context for the listeners of what sure. was the main problem? So... Um, I wrote a book with a co-author, um, James W. Springer, called Repatriation and Erasing the Past. Mm. And the book is in three parts. It's about, um, it's about what we learned from skeletal remains. That's part one. It's, the second part is about the um, burial laws, reburial laws, such as the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, known as NAGPRA. And the third part is why... Um, the laws are um, 
are both um, problematic from a scientific point of view and also possibly unconstitutional. Yeah. Um, and so when I wrote this book with my co-author, Jim, then basically it came out in September 2020. And by December of that year, there was a big backlash against the book with an open letter where about a thousand people signed it who um, wanted the book retracted. The publisher did not retract the book, but did issue an apology. Like Inquisition. <laughs> yes. And then I also, um, I gave a talk at, uh, at a meeting, the Society for American Archaeology meeting uh, about repatriation laws. And um, that was deplatformed. And um, then there were a few other aspects that arose. Uh, I wrote an uh, opinion piece for the main newspaper here mm. that, against, that was stating my case against reburial laws. And um, I had a photo of me withholding a skull, which would have never been controversial. Uh, I've seen that, before. yeah. Um, but it caused controversy, I think, in the context of this greater thing, because actually the op-ed, um, the opinion piece that I wrote came out a month or so after the, I posted the photo. And the mm -hmm. photo was not even mentioned beforehand. And then people read the opinion piece and then they went back to the photo. Mm, yeah, so they were, you know, um, so my university initially acted like, um, like they were supportive, mm. um, but then uh, the support deteriorated. <laughs> um, mm. And they started taking retaliatory action against me, or what I would view as a retaliatory action, if you want to be as neutral as possible. Well, they actually uh, changed the locks of, of your facility, they right? Changed the, they changed the locks of the research, um, if, of the curation facility, so I could not access any skeletal remains. Wow. Now, they say that this is because of the NAGPRA, the changes in the, in the reburial laws, but there were other remains there that had nothing to do with reburial um, laws. The Carthage collection was literally in the curation facility when they changed the locks. When I mentioned this to this, this to them, they still changed the locks. It took me months to get that Carthage collection. And for months, they wanted to keep me away from it and even held a departmental meeting trying to um, forced me to agree to not taking any photographs of bones um, in order to get access to the collection. And I would not, I would not go for that. I did eventually get access to the collection, as we now know. But the other thing is, um, other actions that were taken against me include, um, you know, changing the rules to have a guest speaker series to try to avoid my ability to bring a speaker to the campus. Um, mm. When my, with the backlash of my book, my chair decided that he would have a anti-racism speaker series to, to um, as a response to my book. And so I contacted him and I said, um, you know, um, I, I would like to have a, a counterbalance um, speaker series. And, he said immediately, he said, there's no money and there's, and I have no ability to provide you any assistance. Uh, the, the office staff cannot use their time. Um, and he said, it's too close to the end of the semester. And I said, okay, that's fine. How about next semester? And he said, oh, wait, we have these rules that we have in place, rules we never used before, rules which he did not use for his anti-racism speaker series. And um, I said, um, this is not fair. Um, and it wasn't fair. Um, and so that was an another aspect of it. Um, he had, um, he and the dean ho um, gave a talk about um, what to do with when your tenured colleague is branded a racist. This was specifically about me. They mm. changed my name in it, but it was specifically about me. Wow. And mm. although, of course, they are free to, talk about it, this, their freedom of speech too. But the fact is that in that speaker series, they said that, that what they would try to do is they would try to isolate me. They would try to keep resources away from me. And if I taught my perspective 
in the classroom. They would try to remove me from the classroom and they plan to give me an incompetent review and mm. my next um, review, my next empo employee but, review. But this is, this is incredible because you all you are doing is defending the truth from the scientific point of view, right? Because the yeah. remainings that they are trying to repatriate, they, I mean, from the scientific point of view, there's no proof that they belong to those. Yeah, tribe, there's, right? I, there's no, um, there's no real proof that the that the collection that I studied is linked to any modern tribe. But and we'll get um, to that in, in a second because I, I do want to um, address that issue. But um, but the thing is that with the the depart the department chair and the dean making those statements, they can make those statements, but they can't actually follow through on them. You can say what you want, <laughs> but you can't take action. And they did take action. Um, after that, they did try, they continued to try to keep resources away from me. And um, so I do think that they were retaliatory. I do think that they were, um, that their actions speak to that. I always followed repatriation laws. I still would. I have, I can disagree with something and still follow the law. I know, you know, that's, True. That's, I mean, um, it's about you know, having different opinions, right? It's yeah. a different opinion. So I can say, you know, I'm going to write as much as I want and, and talk about this law as much as I want and how wrong I think it is because I want it to change. <laughs> but yeah. I will always follow the law in my work because um, I don't want to get the university and I've never wanted to get the university or the department or myself in trouble. Um, I think that the law is wrong. I think it is wrong to rebury remains. I think you can ask yourself at what point is a collection close enough related to a modern tribe or a modern people that it makes it makes sense. I would say that for me, um, I don't, I'm not religious. So I don't mm -hmm. have that concept of oh, we should bury these remains because the uh, spirits are restless mm. or things mm. like that. Um, but I think that the compromise has ended. And the compromise ended when they basically said that skeletal remains that are were once determined as not affiliated, not linked to a modern tribe, now need to be reburied. Mm. And we see this not only... Uh, in California, but all across the states. Um, and basically, you know, we have reburials of what we call paleo Indians, which are 8,000 years old or older. Mm. And the mm. oldest continuous tribe that we know of, I believe, are the Pueblo, which mm. is dates to about, they have a continuous record of about 2,000 years. So, so we, the argument is just based on, on myths, right? Basically. It's based on myths. I would say it's based on creation myths. It's based mm -hmm. on um, like folklore, based on, on mythology. And I would argue that that is the wrong way to make these decisions. I don't know what um, you think, Marta. Sorry to interrupt, but I just, I mean, I'm just thinking that we've interviewed like uh, two famous astronomers here. And both have ended up talking about how religion or you know non-scientific uh, theories meddle in their work and it's kind of, it's kind of scary right i mean i, I is, and i think it's particularly uh quite big in the united states or at least that's my impression from abroad right that's the that religion has a, a great part in in you know in scientific decisions and it's scary right i think that it does um and um part of it is um you know, our history of, of the U.S. being in part formed because of individuals escaping from religious persecution. I also, um, but I also think that um, one of the, in, like if you look at Australia and New Zealand and Canada, they all have the same problem. Mm. It's just, um, yeah, it's true. just the U.S. has a much, I, the Maybe U.S. Impact. has a much bigger footprint, so yeah. to speak. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. So, like Canada, I spent three years living in Canada, 
And during that time, um, I was doing um, research at the Canadian Museum of Civilization, and there were the same repatriation issues going on there, and for the same reasons. So, you know, I, I do think that in some ways, yes, religion is a big issue in the U.S., but it is in other places too. It just doesn't, the, yeah. um, the U.S. has such a big footprint that sometimes this uh, overshadows the uh, problems in other places. I no, think. That's true. In Europe, we have some kind of the same problem, but it's just from, from my impression is like when I hear from the United States, it's just maybe the, because of what you say, right? It has a bigger footprint and yeah, it seems bigger, but yeah. And, and my perspective on religion and science is that it doesn't matter what religion. So mm. I feel like for, for many people in the university system, they are very um, strong um, opponents of Christian religions, like uh, creationism from a Christian perspective, Adam and Eve and so forth, but they give a pass to other religions. You mm. know, if you mentioned something about Islam, um, then they are not going to fight against it. Yeah, if I can't you imagine mention why. something about, <laughs> about Native American religions, they're not going to fight against it. So I think that there is this kind of hypocrisy. And my view is, I, I view it all as equal. <laughs> yeah. It's like there's beliefs and then there's trying to figure out the scientific truth. But maybe in the, in the case of repatri uh, in this law, for instance, isn't that maybe that uh, uh, people from the United States feel guilty, the legislators or something or not? Um, I do think that they do feel guilty. Yeah, um, no, <laughs> I don't know. I don't think that they should. Okay. I personally don't think that people should feel guilty for something that happened. I know, but uh, hundreds of years before they were but, born. But this know? is what I, I have the same with my South American friends. I am Spanish, and and you, when I and we kind of joke about our role as Spanish in the <laughs> in the right. in their history. Yeah, I I absolutely think that that is part of the issue. Another aspect of the of the repatriation issue is that as it might seem like it's this really niche, like a small part of the, of, you know, what is important in the world, you know, only into, of importance to those who study skeletal remains, but it's not, it's important on a greater issue, on a greater issue because it's part of this kind of, um, what we call the postmodern agenda, where who says something is more important than whether that is true or not. And therefore, um, you know, a person's uh, political identity determines how much weight we should give what they're saying, as opposed to whether they're, they're right or not. Mm -hmm. And I always think that the per a person's social identity, their skin color, their sex, their religion, their race, whatever, shouldn't actually have any bearing on whether uh, what they're telling us is valid or not. Sure. And that's another aspect of this story. Um, and it always spreads. You know, when repatriation laws were first written, they were written as a compromise to say, you know what, we'll the the remains that are linked to modern day tribes will give back and then we will keep the remains that are not and continue to study them mm. and if you look at the tribe if you look at the collections that have been repatriated um over 90 percent of them that have been linked to a modern tribe have been repatriated and there were still plenty to study but that wasn't enough and now they mm. want to repatriate the ones that are not linked to tribe. Everything. And once those are gone, that won't be enough either. So one of the things that's happening at my university is that it's um, that they plan on burning the x-rays. The x-rays that were taken of these skeletal remains. What? Um, are, what? You know, so it's not just going to be the removal of the bones. It will be the burning of the x-rays. They want to... Um, destroy the records and the why um, photographs why because it's not about 
uh, just the reburial, it's about the, it's basically, you know, kind of a destruction of science in my Jesus view. Christ, Inquisition, so, like, <laughs> totally. It's, yeah, it's the equivalent of burning books. And yes. I wouldn't be surprised if that's next. And this is what's very troublesome, because if it was just about reburying bones, we could have a disagreement and come to a conclusion where how, how far back do we want to go? Mm. What is the connection? What, you know, we could, we could come to some kind of compromise. Um, mm. And I might disagree with the compromise, yeah, sure. but it would be something I could live with, so to speak, right? Um, and that's what NAGPRO, that's what the laws first intended. But the compromise has broken down. And now we're talking about burning x-rays, destroying photos. Um, the, the Society for American Archaeology has decided that, um, that there will be no photographs in any of their journals of skeletal remains. They, you may be able to submit a sketch of a bone. This is, <laughs> mm. this is it's outrageous. Insane. It's yeah. insane, right? Christ. And so this is what I'm, this is why it's not just about the bones. Um, I, I, when I started to look at the Carthage collection, which is not Native American at all, um, one of the things is that it has some interesting diseases on the bones, some interesting disease patterns on the bones. And um, I plan, uh, I've, I planned to take photographs of all those things. And so when my department was fighting my access to those collections in order to, and trying to get me to basically um, agree to a no photograph policy, uh, two arguments that were made. Um, one was, well, we shouldn't take photographs of any bones because if tribes, indigenous people see bones photographs of bones, then that will upset them. Well, these are not Native American bones. Why should they have veto power over them in a sense? Um, but imagine that this goes beyond anthropology and goes into medicine. Are you willing to see a medical doctor who has never seen a human body? Well, <laughs> you know, maybe there are many of that. Then. <laughs> are you yeah. willing? Right? I mean, this is this is what we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then the other thing is, the other argument was, um, I should have per permission from all the all the people that I study to have the, to use their photograph. Well, this is a, an absurdity considering that mm. they died seven hundred years ago. You know, mm. um, these are kind of straw man arguments. But what the whole system is basically in place to destroy science for the promotion of these kind of indigenous perspectives. Mm. Actually, um, what is the point of view, for example, of your students that actually are going to be the future of the field and them seeing what's happening? Like, I can imagine they're not very happy about this, right? Um, you know, I, I think that there's quite a, a wide range. Uh, I try to, when I teach a, about repatriation, I always give both sides, um, mm. my perspective, of course, but also people who disagree with me. I do think that in the end, I, of course, I want them to agree with me, but I want them to come to that decision seeing both sides of the story. And I don't like, I don't set up a straw man. I assign the best pro repatriation argument paper that I can, right? To give them the, the most to think about. And if they come on the side of, oh, I do think repatriation is important, that's, that is their decision. Um, I never grade on opinion. I always, there are 207 bones in the human body. I have plenty to test them on without asking them, opinion, um, asking to grade them on opinions. Um, but um, I'm just, if you think about my own department, um, I'm the only professor I think who, who thinks this way. Mm -hmm. And I, I hope 
that more professors um, give students the ability to work through these things with uh, being as balanced as possible, um, even assigning people that they don't like and keeping it neutral. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, and not grading on whether they agree with them or not. But I do know that this is not always the case. Um, I know of certain professors um, who, uh, even in my past, who graded on opinion, uh, even when I was a student. And, and I always thought that this was an improper way of teaching in the sense mm -hmm. that I think that we are here to teach students to think about the issues, mm -hmm. not to decide the issue for them. Um, I suspect that the majority of students um, are, um, are being taught so much uh, on the other side of the issue, uh, the, you know, are being given so much information about the other side that they're not seeing both sides equally um, or fairly. Um, so I do, I do worry that this is going, going to end archaeology as we know it in, mm. in the US and in Canada and Australia and New Zealand and particularly. Um, I know students get very, you know, they get very engaged when we actually deal with skeletal remains. I'm teaching, for example, forensic osteology now where we have teaching collections that we utilize to learn all the bones. And this is a very popular class. It's a, it's a fun class to learn these things. It's very hands-on, um, but in the future, this may not be possible. Mm. So I'm, I'm not extremely hopeful <laughs> when it comes to the next generation. I Neither hope I'm I wrong. Am. After seeing the flat earth uh, defenders, I'm not, I'm not uh, hopeful for anything. <laughs> a spaghetti monster believers yeah. as well. But it's, uh, I think it's, uh, it's very, I think, uh, much appreciated that you are trying to teach them critical thinking as well and showing not only presenting your side, but giving them a choice basically, but also paying attention to for them not to believe in everything they hear because that's why they're in university for and not to just blindly follow. So I think it's, uh, it's very noble. Um, can we ask you a little bit about uh, like your future plans? Do you have any more books planned? Anything exciting coming up? Well, um, currently, um, so I'm I'm currently in a lawsuit with the university, which I filed. Mm -hmm. um, that will be moving forward. The lawsuit is not in regards to to repatriation laws, but rather their reaction to me for expressing my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll see where that leads. Um, I am currently working on a skeletal collection, the Carthage collection, that um, I hope will give me a few, a few research um, papers. Um, I have, uh, I, this weekend, um, I will be attending, um, or is it next weekend? The, the 4th and the 5th of November. <laughs> uh, I'll be attending the um, Stanford uh, Academic Freedom Conference. Mm -hmm. I have a conference coming up in a, a couple weeks after that, where I will be presenting. So I have a, a, you know several things um, in the near future. I do hope to write a book, um, be, another book. Um, I will see how it um, how it develops. I have a few ideas in mind and um, been working on. Some of those things. One is a, an edited volume of some of the um, with some other people on these issues. Another one um, possibility is I would love to write an, a book um, on the collection, the Ryan Mound collection, as a popular science book of um, basically um, the first inhabitants of Silicon Valley um, mm -hmm. and all we've learned from studying those skeletal remains. But uh, I also plan to write a book about my experience in these last couple of years about, um, you know, my, um, how my career and the retaliation I faced and, you know, the, 
the various aspects of that. I hope to write a book on that. Mm -hmm. So maybe three more. Okay, cool. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Okay, can I ask you something? What has affected you the most uh, during all this uh, uh, ordeal? Like uh, the nonsense of non being able to take into account scientific considerations or the backlash from social networks and the pressure that's, that it takes? I think both of those are so intertwined, it's difficult to mm -hmm. say. Um, I find that um, in a sense, um, mood-wise or like, Um, you know, when people attack me or call me names, and, and that's one of the things that most of the time they're calling me like grave robber, or ghoul or racist or, you know, things like that. That doesn't bother me. I don't know why, but it doesn't bother me. I kind of mm. laugh it off. And, you know, if somebody, wants to call me, <laughs> if somebody wants to call me a ghoul, that's okay. Mm. <laughs> okay. But um, I think what's affected me the most is losing... Um, losing the access um, to, you know, not only the collection, of course, but, but this kind of creeping loss of access. So, you know, of course, the collection, which you could argue was, is related to the re reburial laws, but then, you know, them expanding it to include the x-rays and then expanding it to include the any photographs that were taken and the reports. And finally, um, and also I asked to have access to the non-human remains that were basically uh, basically the garbage, you know, because I do some bone biology research and I figured that, that it's a large collection that hasn't been looked at. I could see what I could do with that. Um, and I was told those, are, those two are sacred. Um, so, That has been, um, you know, very problematic. One of the interesting things is that the provost um, has told me that there will be no research on the on this Ryan Mound co collection, even from previously collected data. Well, mm. that is impossible Insane. to enforce, except for on me, because of course, yeah. other, um, you know, if you had if you had come and, to study the remains and had the data. And then you left and you're and we had visitors from all over the world studying the collection who have data on it. None of them can be held to account of, oh, you can't study the data you collected, um, but they can hold me to account because they're my boss and they could you know, take action against me as we've seen. So I do think that these kind of things are the most problematic. I can say. Yeah. Sorry if I'm, I look very serious, but I'm just, when I, when I listen to the story, I just get, I don't know, I just get very deeply moved. I think it's so sad, like that the whole situation. And um, also, um, I think we are running out of time, but we, we are always asking one specific question, but I would like to make it two in one because I think you okay. can give us some very um, kind of very useful and um, good answer to this. One would be, What is the lesson you learned, lesson or a couple of lessons you learned through these experiences? And another question is that, um, do you have any sort of advice to share with the listeners or anything that comes to your mind maybe you would like to share with people who listen? Okay. I think the lesson, one of the lessons I've learned is um, to, it, and I don't know if this is just my personality anyways, but one of the lessons I've learned is um, to, expect and prepare for the worst, mm -hmm. but celebrate all victories. So for example, um, when my university decided to rewrite the rules of how, who can um, and how to gain access to, to mm -hmm. the collections, um, they included in one of those rules um, that menstruating personnel, and that's the term they use, personnel, menstruating personnel could not handle any bones, any human remains. No and way. I quickly <laughs> pointed out, my lawyer and I quickly were like, this is a title line violation. This is sex discrimination. Jesus yeah. Christ, and, I mean, um, but so, that's for real? <laughs> yeah, and I so I caught, we told them that I planned to file that this mm -hmm. was sex discrimination, and they Jesus removed Christ. that rule. So... I think Thank that you. that was a, <laughs> yeah. that was a victory 
that was a, a victory yeah. that you know I hadn't expected. I hadn't expected the problem, but I hadn't expected the victory either. Mm-hmm. So um, I think you know, prepare for the worst, celebrate all victories, even the small ones. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing I think that um, my advice is um, to not let the you know the name calling and so forth get to you because in some ways. If the, if the argument is that I'm a ghoul, and if that's their that's their strongest statement, then they obviously don't have an argument, right? Yeah. yeah. If um and so I do think that this is a sign of a weak argument. Um. I think that um there are so many supporters out there too, and uh, although we tend to focus on those people who dislike us, <laughs> mm. um, I've met literally you know dozens of people who've come out and said you know uh that they support my perspective some of whom um i've now co-authored with um Mm -hmm. and many of whom uh you know i have a great deal of respect for um and so i do think that it's there are people out there who are very supportive and when you focus on that instead of on the hate yeah, we can see you are very strong and it's admirable that you are, can uh, ignore, uh, quote unquote, all of this uh, backlash against you. And as Lawrence Cross uh, in our last interview said, uh, what was what, what he said, Marta? He said like, chin up and done, chin up and <laughs> done with thing. the bastards or something like that. Yes, chin up and done with the bastards. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> We're going to all tattoo it one day. And I yeah. want think about that. I think about it. Yeah. <laughs> No, but it's great. Uh, it's super admirable and uh, really, really love to have you here and listen to about your story. Um, I think you gave us a lot of insight into your field and also what's happening. And as I told you already before, um, I'm deeply moved actually by what you what you told us. Uh, and it's, mm. I'm actually very shocked as well, especially about the thing you mentioned about the menstruation and yeah. not being able to access certain facilities like this is that's ridiculous. But I'm very happy you shared that with us. Um, and it was lovely to talk to you. Yeah, Thank same. you so much for having me. Yeah, yeah, same. Um, I hope we can host you when you write another book or in, in the future. Yes. I mean, it was Not a pleasure. Three books as well. <laughs> <laughs> three interviews more. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Have a good week and take care. Bye bye. 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 Bye bye.